Hello, my name is Nick Fothergill. Welcome to You're Not In The Forces Now. This debriefing session was part of the residential lifestyle program in Victoria. I hope at the end of the video you find the information in it of value to you and I hope that it helps you move on to a much better life. Thank you for listening. The next um, session that we're going to look at uh, is called You're Not In The Forces Now and I'll, I'll give you a bit of a, a guide to where it came from. This has been part of the lifestyle course for about five years and it actually arose out of some letters that I wrote when I was in Vietnam. And like many of us, what I thought the letters were about was about the weather and the food. One page long, last paragraph said, got to go on patrol now, or got to go on operations, or got to go on picket duty, or whatever, as an excuse to, to finish off because I didn't have anything to write about. I wrote about 32 letters, and my wife kept them all, and she numbered them in order. And in 1994, I started to read them. Now, I read them for, attempted to read them one weekend and um, got a little bit distressed, so threatened to destroy them. She took them off me and told me to calm down, grow up, do all that sort of stuff. And then, um, when I was calm enough to read them again, so the following weekend I, I reread the letters. And what I found was that I hadn't written about the food and the weather in the early stages. What I'd actually written about was what was happening inside my head as I was going through the, um, the pre-embarkation period, the trip over on the Sydney, and then the first operations and the various ones in, until a letter that was about nine pages when a mate of mine was killed pretty well close to me. Now, that letter after that operation was um, nine pages long, and was full of all the sorts of anger and hate and all that sort of stuff. After that, there were no more letters about what my thinking was about. From that point on, all the letters were about with the, what I could remember them. One page is on that little, you know, the little pad that had the map of Vietnam on it and the stuff? And that was basically all that was written. At the same time, I had only just finished as a, a tactics instructor in training command in the infantry. And I had been out of my psych training for about four years. So the combination of the letters, the recent experience as still as an instructor, and as uh, a psychologist all came together in, into the session. The title of it, You're Not in the Force, and now came from the fact that every time I'd come back out of an exercise in the bush, my wife would always say to me, you're not in the army now. And she'd make me take off all my army gear and put it in a shed. And I was never allowed to bring it into the house. And uh, so I've just changed the title of it for that. What I want to explain to you is that where you may believe that, that Vietnam is the cause of so much of the trauma, what I want to start you to think about is that Vietnam was only the point where the trauma was reinforced, that a lot of the, the behaviours that you have and the, the sorts of stresses you exhibit now and the ways that you cope now really had more to do with your training than it ever did to do with Vietnam. The Vietnam simply was the icing on the cake that embedded it into your system. In order to do that, I need you to start to think about how we are trained. And I'll let Napoleon have the first say. A man does not have himself killed for a few halfpence a day. You must speak to the soul in order to electrify the man. And Napoleon was quite correct. In order to get us to fight, you have to speak to the soul. You've got to train inside. That humans are not creatures that necessarily go out and fight a war as part of our normal everyday life. So what we have to do is we have got to start to change the way you operate. And in order to change the way you operate, I need you to start to think about your first few days in the military. So let's go back, and we'll go back to the military. Before you went in, 30 guys arrive in the camp. Okay, They arrive in a bus. And what did they look like? Beans. And a civilian haircut in those days was what? 
longer hair, okay? So the 30 guys in the bus were all different. They get off the bus at Kapuka or Pakapanyal. When you get off the bus, what happens? The little girl in front of everybody. Okay. Yelled and screamed at. They then marched off to wherever. And then what happens? Tell me the next 24 hours. What happens in the next 24 hours? Haircut. So we all get a nice little trim and we can have the sideboards and that, or what happens? Everything over the top. All the same. Okay. What happens to your clothing, your civilian clothing? Put in a bag. Bag is put away in the queue store, out of sight for weeks. And you are issued with? Everything, right down to your underwear. So, everything is done. You get assigned a number, you have a rank. And we talk army, what was the rank? Private. What was the rank? Recruit. recruit. What's a private? No. Private's above a recruit. What's higher than a recruit in the army? No. Yeah, the CO's dog outranks a, a recruit, doesn't he? <laughs> so the recruit, lowest of the low. And over the next couple of days, you get to bed, lights out at 10 o'clock. They're on at 6 o'clock in the morning. So you get eight hours sleep, do you not? Yeah. Oh, yeah? What happens in that eight hours that you're supposed to be sleeping? Yes, what else? Because you're not issued with sparkling, shining boots, are you? Okay. So in the, even in the eight hours that you're supposed to be sleeping, you're spending your time having to clean gear, to practice stuff, or whatever. So in the end, you get minimal hours of sleep. And when you wake up the next morning, how were you woken up out of your bed? Rudely. 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 What's another word for rudely in this thing? Passive or aggressive? aggressive? Very aggressive, isn't it? Okay. If you happen to lay in, then you were turfed out of your bed. And then your day starts. And how much rest do you get through that day? All right. So what are we doing to you? All right, you say brainwashing. Tell me what brainwashing is about. What are we brainwashing here? Brain okay, so what process are we conditioning? Go back to yesterday when, when Helga was talking about your stress responses. You need to learn a particular mechanism. What was that called? Can you remember what we called it? Fight and flight response. Okay, how many of you, when young fellows went rabbiting, used to go spotlighting rabbits. Okay, so you go spotlighting rabbits. What happens when the rabbit's hit with the spotlight at night? Freezes. Freezes. So the rabbit, being confused with something that is totally out of the ordinary, such as blinding light in the middle of the night, freezes. A stress response, a normal stress response. What do we have as humans? When you're confronted with something that is totally out of the ordinary, that you do not expect, what would you normally do? What is our normal response? Before the panic, you do something. You stop dead, you freeze. Okay, now if that's normal, the normal human stress response, now if that's normal and we didn't do any training and I took you in a military situation, sent you to war with that response and at the first loud shot that rang out or whatever happened and you froze, what would happen? Bad investment, isn't it? If I'm going to send you into that environment and I allow you to have what is normal to the civilian world or the civilian person, then I'm going to invest thirty, forty thousand dollars in equipping you and training you for you to be killed at the first sign of a, uh, anything like a shot ringing out. So I have got to change the flight and fight. So how do I do it? And we say recruit training is approximately three months. What's one of the very first things you learn? when you're in the army, in the military? Drill. drill. What is the very first drill movement you learn? Standard Tension standard ease, which involves how many movements? That's one movement. To get you to do that, what do I do? Will you please stand at attention? Or would you stand at ease everybody? No, what do I do? I yell. I scream. The command aloud. You do that movement, that first simple drill movement. You do that by aggressive commands. And you do that movement over and over until you can do it how? 
without thinking. All right, so we've got without thought. What's another word for without thought and automatic? Instinctive. I then teach you to turn right and turn left. Several movements. Again, by how? We do it by numbers, we do it by repetition, we do it by loud commands. Until you can do it how? I then move it up to the about turn. Then when I've got you doing the stationary drill, then what do I get you to do? On the march. Now in between doing all this drill, I also teach you about the food, about rations and a bit about the weapons, some basic weapon stuff. And again with the weapon. How do I train you on the weapon? Repetitious, over and over and over again. Punishment if you don't do it right. If you do not perform your drill right, I punish you. If you persist in not performing it right, who do I punish? The platoon. And what does a platoon do after knock-off time to you? They sort out you. So I use not only the discipline, but I also use peer punishment for the ones that don't toe the line. If you don't toe the line, you're punished by your mates. And we build up this over and over again. We then go into that mode, all right, that automatic instinctive mode. So as soon as a command is yelled out, you will do what? Do it immediately. Okay. Now you do this very well. And at the end of this period, what happens? The end of your recruit training, what actually happens? You have a? You get a reward. What's one of the rewards you get? No, not yet. You get a march out parade, you get a small pay increase, and you get some leave before your next bit of training. This reward of the pass out parade, who is it in front of? What are they? What are civilians by now? In the scheme of things, you were way up here now. You've done your recruit training. And the civilians were way down there, even less than a recruit. So you have your pass out parade. And then you head off to core training. And again, that's about three months. Now, we'll go to infantry corps training as the most extreme form of training. But remember, all corps, all services still have to train to be able to fight. We did drill in the recruit training. Can anyone remember what happens in corps training? The infantry ones amongst us specifically, particularly in this case. What sort of training do you now do? What sort of drills are these called? Can you remember? Yeah, contact drills. <coughs> and if you remember, one of the very first things you learn is what's called the immediate action. Now, not the immediate action on the weapon, but the immediate action on the firing of a shot. Can any of you remember what the points are? Yes, but it had a sequence. Run, down, crawl, observe, aim, fire. So the minute a shot rings out, you run a few paces, you hit the ground, you move from where you hit the ground, you have a little look. If you can see where it comes from, you then return the fire. In the process of doing that, you then have to call out one of four things. Can you remember what the four contact drills are? Contact front? No, the contact left and right are called what? Ambush left, ambush right, contact rear. And the minute those things are called out, you go into a sequence of responses of what you have to do. How do I get you to do the contact drills? Here, I got you to do it by yelling at you. How do I get you to do it here? What do I use now? 
Yep, I use simulated weapon fire. You know, thunder flashes, um, blanks, uh, whatever. And the minute that that rings out, you then go into that sequence. And I get you to do it how? Until you can do it how? Again, instinctive. Over and over again until it becomes instinctive. In the process of all this, remember we talked to the psychiatrist about some of the signs of post-traumatic stress. And several of the things in post-traumatic stress are the criteria are hypervigilance, that's being extra vigilant, and an exaggerated startle response. That means being startled, but in a much more intense way. Rather than a freeze, you actually go into some sort of action. What do you think these sorts of responses are? They are hypervigilant, aren't they? Extra alert. So what I'm saying is that of all the groups that may, people that may suffer post-traumatic stress, the soldier is probably the only one who is trained in advance for some of the criteria for post-traumatic stress. So if you think that this criteria is because you went to Vietnam, what I'm saying is that you were actually trained to be that way before you went. To give those of you a bit of an idea of how powerful this training has to be, I want you all to imagine that we've got a busy street out here. Okay? Traffic going up and down, up and down. Right? All of a sudden, two cars meet. <laughs> Bang. What would the normal response be? What would you normally do when you heard that? You'd stop. You'd turn and have a look at it. You'd look out at the traffic and there's the two cars. If they're stationary, you make a decision about what it is you're going to do. However, in this case, one of them has ricocheted off the other and it is coming straight towards the window for you. What would you do? Which way? Okay, it's coming this way, you run that way. Tell me what the rule is in an ambush. Face into the ambush and do what? Assault through it. Which is equivalent to doing what? For those of you who haven't been in the military, what you've got to train a soldier to do is to actually walk towards the car coming towards you. Because that's what you have to do in an ambush, turn into it. So that's equivalent to the car coming towards you, you turning towards it, and as it comes to you, you walk towards it. Now you tell me, is that a normal, natural thing to do? Your whole body is saying to you, get away, get away, get away. But you have to be so well trained that you will override that. I get you to do that through this process. Okay. We said that this process changes your flight and fight. What do you think I've now done by the end of six months to this response here? Okay, so what am I working on getting rid of? I'm working on getting rid of that. And instead of operating in this normal area in the middle, which you could call the flow area, a bit of give and take, where am I pushing you? Towards this way here. Okay, now obviously, we're in Australia. It's in a peacetime environment in Australia. So I can't have you being right here, can I? Otherwise you'd be punching the lights out on everybody. So what do you think I'm actually doing? What do you think I'm do doing to you? Programming into you or what? All right, a, a level of alertness. What is a video uh, recorder when it, or a TV when it isn't on but it isn't off? Standby. Okay, so let's say that what we've got somewhere in here a standby button. In other words, instead of going into the fight mode from here, 
or going into the flight mode, I've got you up here so you have just a limited and a much quicker reaction time. Follow? The automatic, the exaggerated, you fire up a lot faster. At the end of this session here, at the end of your core training, what else do you get? Another reward. And who do you do this in front of? Okay, now, by now, of course, what are civilians? They are somewhere back down there. You don't talk to them, you don't associate with them. They know nothing. You are what? Wars fought by young men. What are you? What else are you? What else are you? Fighting machines, the best soldiers that have ever been produced, the greatest in the world, invincible, all that sort of stuff. If you don't believe that, what's going to happen? All right. Okay, so I've programmed that button into you. Now I want you to start to think about your life in three cups of water. Pre-military, you think, consider yourself a cup of water. In the bottom of your glass of water or your cup of water, there's a little bit of water in the bottom, which I call good stress. What is good stress? When did you manage? Manage? What, yeah, what does it actually do? Get you motivated. Get you motivated, get you out of bed, get you showered, dress, get you breakfast, get you up and moving from being in bed. It isn't debilitating, it's not bad, it's not dangerous, it is just that little bit of stress. Now, on a daily basis, out of the environment in which you live, various stressors occur, and they could be related to work, they could be related to money, it could be related to family, and all sorts of other things. What do those stressors do to your level of water as they occur? Raises the level. As you deal with those stressors, what happens to the level of water? It goes down. So on a daily basis or a weekly basis, as things occur, your stress builds up, you deal with it, it goes down. And that's how you operate. If the stress builds up too much, what happens to the water? It overflows. Huh? It overflows. Okay? So it's got a natural overflow. And the normal natural overflow could be something like tears or some sort of sign that you're under a bit of pressure and it's over the top. So you have a great capacity to deal with life's daily pressures. I've now taken this civilian and subjected them to this sort of training. All right? I've created that button. Where do you think I've put that button in the cup of water? Five eighths of the way up? You said at the top. Let's try up there. Why do I put it at the top of the cup? No more than that, because I don't want what to happen. I don't want you to break down. I don't want you to go into that overflow. What I want you to do is, yeah, is when that stress builds up, I want you to explode into, guess what I've taught you? Explode into this automatic action. So this standby button now becomes an anger button. Your normal level of good stress is there. But remember now, what I've also done is I put you on a higher level of alert. So this has got to be in your cup somewhere. And we'll make it nice and blue. And we'll put it up here. And we'll call that alert. And that extra alertness equates to this shift up here. Switched on. You're more switched on. You're a switched on soldier. You're not fighting at this stage, but you're switched on. And you go to war. They send you off to war. Now war is one humongous great stressor, is it not? Just going into a war zone is a stressor. Then around that you have things like if you're in harbour mines or likely mines. On the roads you've got land mines. You could be out, you could have sniper fire, artillery fire. They are little stressors on top of the big stress of war. Each time 
You meet one of these stressors when you're out in the field, what happens? Goes up, up, and all of a sudden, the weapon's fired, you hit that button, and what do you do? You respond. How? Instinctively, without thought. You explode. Because fighting is all about exploding, is it not? You have to hate... So why is it that you hate the enemy? What does hating the enemy allow you to do? To kill him. Because in the end, what is war actually about? No, forget eliminate. Let's say the word. What is war about? Not even winning. It's about what? No? Killing. It's about you kill them before they kill you. You don't go out there in a war zone to bat the cricket ball or whatever backwards and forwards and win by getting out more runs than the other guy, you go out there to make sure that you can kill them before they kill you. So that explosion, you have to have anger and you have to have hate. Hate is the emotion that will fire up the anger, that will release the adrenaline, that will let you fight. You can't hit the adrenaline if you don't have anger and the hate. What I do in my, this training is to say that if I'm going to give you the hate, and that's where the enemy have all their various names, but they're never called by a name. If I give you the hate and I teach you the anger, I also give you the skills to use instinctively when you hit that button, which means that when you get angry, you fight. You explode into anger and do what the angry thing's in. Now, you hit that button. How many times could you hit that button in one day, let alone in one week or one month or one year? Many, many times. Many, many times. In fact, towards over time, you even hit that button with your mates. Remember your mates in the tent who were your mates in the first week or two or three? How were they starting to look by about month three or month four? How, yes, how did you start to fight and get on each other's nerves? So in the end, it was safer to put you back out in the field than to have you back behind. So this goes on and on and on. Remember here, though, when you did this well, you got a reward. When you did this well, you got a reward. When you do this well, you get a reward as well. What is the reward for doing this well? Come back and come out. Stay alive. Life. Can you think of a greater reward? It's not about medals. It's not about your cans. It's not about leave, is it? What is it actually about? Oh, I did this well enough that I survived. Can you understand where this survivor guilt comes from? If you survive and your mate didn't. Okay? Because you make the assumption that he didn't survive because he didn't do it well and you were somehow at fault because you should have taught him better to do it well. And so you start to get the guilts about the fact that somebody died and you didn't. But irrespective of that, what you've got to be clear about is if the reward is that you lived, what does that say about this system? Okay, you make a direct connection, do you not, between this reward and this training, and you say it is a absolutely brilliant system because it did what it saved my life so i've embedded it in you so so far can you see what's happened now, i've taken away from you your normal stress response your normal civilian way of operating and in its place i put a totally different package with severe inner stress with a button an explosive anger button and giving you a reward Okay? Now, you come back, and here we are, post-war cup. What have I got to put in that cup? Did we have any form of debriefing? Okay, so what's missing off that cup at the moment? There are some other things I've got to put there. Okay, so you're still hyped up. Maybe not to the same level because you have come back, but you are still hyped up.
What else is in that cup, though, that you haven't um, mentioned? What should be there? Come on, have a look at this one here. Anger. Anger. Do you think that just because you come back, that button's going to go? Okay, so that anger button still stays there. So here we are, we're back. Now this here, this internal tension when you went to war, this hypervigilance, this exaggerated startle response, this ability to fire up and explode when it was really necessary was considered to be what? Switched on, good soldiering. You've come back, you still have some of that inner tension reinforced by Vietnam. But what's the difference now with this inner tension? It's a bad one. You could call this good stress or alertness or whatever. What do you think we could almost translate this into? It's a bad stress. Why don't we call it PTSD? which is a form of anxiety and stress. So what, what's happened is that we've, in effect, we've been trained into it. It's been reinforced by this. It sits in there. It's now a bad stress, but it sits inside you. But the world out there, you get on with your life, do you not? You've got to get on with it. So here we are. We're back in our normal environment. Monies, family, work. What's our capacity to deal with those things now? Okay, so we have a lot less of an area to deal with it. And not only that, when the pressure builds up too much, what happens now? Okay, so, ladies, if you ever wondered why that toothpaste ring on the vanity bar, the coffee ring on the table, the toilet roll around the wrong way suddenly sent your husband into an explosive outburst and you sit and you think to yourself, what have I done? I'm suggesting that maybe you have done absolutely nothing. That what's happened is that there has been stresses built up and that toothpaste stain or the coffee cup stain or the little thing is simply the final stressor that triggered the anger button. And because the veteran has been trained into when I reach this certain level of stress, I know what to do. When my tension and that builds up to this level, I have been taught that this is what you do, explode. And not only have I been taught that what you do is explode, I've actually been rewarded for doing it well. Therefore, the brain doesn't make a distinction between Australia or Vietnam. It simply says, I am under the same pressure I know what to do. And so that insignificant little thing that suddenly creates that over-the-top reaction is quite often nothing whatsoever to do with you at that time. It is just that that button has been hit. And you go into that sort of rage, which was totally out of proportion to the event that triggered it. And I can see by the look in your faces it nodding, you've, you've all been there. And so what do you start to do? You tiptoe around, don't you? On those eggshells, trying to miss them. Because if he goes off his face at that sort of thing, what's he going to do with something worse? Well, the worst things have already been in there. That little thing has just been the flashpoint. Now, the military is pretty smart because the military says, if I'm going to train you to behave this way, and you come back to Australia. I actually can't have you exploding back at the depot or back at the base or whatever willy-nilly at any, any instance. So I'm going to teach you to do something. I'm going to teach you how to deal with it. What do I do? What do I give you to teach you how to hold this back a bit? There's two things, and you get them very cheaply. And when you're in war, you get them almost free. Alcohol and nicotine. Now, the interesting thing about alcohol and nicotine is alcohol is a depressant and nicotine is a stimulant. Okay, so what I do is that while I'm training you in this system here 
at the end of a busy day, at the end of an exercise, or at the end of what, or even the operation, what did you do? Came to the boozer. You went straight to the boozer. It was duty-free in effect. And even if you were underage, as we were in those days, the drinking age of 21, many of us 19, 20, 18, we could drink. So you'd have the alcohol and the nicotine. And in a way, you would have a form of debriefing using alcohol and nicotine. So again, what were you actually starting to do? Self-medicate. What you were starting to do was to say, okay, in order to control this tension and this inner stress, the answer's simple. If I keep on the alcohol, then I'll keep the memory down. If you don't use alcohol and nicotine, guess what the other veteran's preferred way of dealing with this sort of stuff? Workaholic. Become a workaholic. Any sort of system like that that will put a cap on it. The idea being is that those sorts of things cap off that. Because what you believe is if you do these things, you will stop this from breaking through. You follow? As a form of protection for yourself, if I do something like that, what I'm doing is I'm putting a cap on it. All right? Now, those of us that have been there will tell you that ultimately what happens with the cap. If the cap doesn't destroy you and you become a full-on alcoholic or whatever, what actually happens over time? It catches up with you. Because just the process of getting older changes it. War is fought by whom? Young men, full of adrenaline, full of testosterone. As you age, your capacity to handle that sort of pressure decreases. And so what happens is the tensions and stresses are still here, but the body isn't 20. It's no longer 30. It's no longer 40. So somewhere after this event, you're going to reach that point where the pressure and your age meet and you break through. So you ask the question, why now? Why 30 years later? All right, for you, if you're breaking now, why 30 years later? That simply means that you have reached the point where your body and the pressure is no longer able to hold it under and it's starting to break through. For others, some it's been 20s. For some it's been 30s. For some it's been the 40s. And for many in World War II, and a lot of World War II guys we see now, it's in the 80s. But it still happens. It is just that you will reach your time sometime. There is no rule that says just because you're back, it should not go away because it's trained into you. So how do we deal with this stuff? Okay. So, this, so we use drug therapy. And John would have talked to you about drug therapy, using antidepressant medication. Okay, the purpose of antidepressant type medication, again, is simply to do what? Exactly. Cap it. If you think that taking the medication will fix the problem, you are wrong. Taking the medication will simply form a crust on top of this to make it harder for the tension underneath to break through. So what you've got to be clear about, though, with the drug therapy is that it is still only a replacement for the cap. It is not a cure. You've got to add something to it. And you can leave it as talk therapy. Now, what would talk therapy cover? Think about this week. What are some of the things that you do? All right. What's the most, in what was the very first one of the very first session you did? Before that, the first one. Okay, and this is the most crucial of the lot. Learn the breathing. Learn any sort of relaxation skill. Why? That, if you can put the relaxation skill in when you feel you're getting near that button, and you can put in a relaxation skill, a very brief one, what are you actually doing? Exactly, you're releasing the pressure and you're bringing yourself below that button. 
So relaxation is crucial. And then you have to start doing what? If this stuff caps it, what's the idea of the talk therapy? Okay, do you believe that you will get it out of your system totally? No. How can you say that going into a war can be totally eradicated from your system? The only way you're going to do that is if you get something like dementia, Alzheimer's disease, or there is one other way, and we'll talk about that shortly. The idea of these skills is that if the drug therapy works on there, then these skills are designed to start to break this into fragments, to break it down. The reason being is that what you're trying to do with the talk therapy is to lower that, to lessen it, to whichever level you are comfortable with. So you need relaxation. You need some skills. How to resolve conflicts. How to go about it the correct way. How to set goals. How to motivate yourself. Your self-image. Your self-talk. Time management. And you could say, etc. Any sort of learning skill that you can use to break this down. Now, these are all skills. What have you got to do with them? Before that, though, you've got to what with them? You've got to learn them. If you learn to do them well, what are you starting to replace? Yes, you start to get the picture that where this stuff that you're doing fits in is that what you, tr what you should be trying to do is that if you're going to use the medication, you use it as a cap. Bang. You then work on the underlying post-traumatic stress with these sorts of skills, purpose being to start to weaken these instinctive behaviours which are aggressive behaviours for war. They are not the behaviours for the world that you inhabit now. What you should be looking at these about is replacing the aggressive skills that were so important here with these skills which are so important here. The idea being is if you have medication at this level, the cap it, and you've done no talk therapy and you are still down, low self-esteem, low view of yourself, and angry and all that sort of stuff, if you've got that, the idea is that as you build this up, you lower this down until somewhere you come to a balance in your life, until you feel that you've got a balance. Now, what will happen is that you can keep working on this side. You may find that you can never get rid of the medication. And you need to be clear that for some of us, medication in a mild form may be necessary. You will eventually achieve a balance. Yeah? You're going to have days when you will feel stressed and days when you feel totally relaxed. But it's the rhythm, this sort of thing you want. Not this, right? It's this sort of pattern. So the idea is to remember the drug therapy caps it, self-talks, talk therapy builds on the good stressors, breaks down the bad stress until you achieve the balance. Well, I'm just going to talk to you about your life. And I'm going to talk to you about Now, the reason I put 56 there is that is, this year, is the average age of the Vietnam veteran. What age do you go into the military on average? 19. 19. What was national service age? 20. 20. And you've got apprentices and you've got boy sailors and all that sort of stuff. Let's take it at roughly about 19, 20. Up until that stage of your life, what are you being subjected to? You are still a what? Civilian. Civilian. Okay, so let's have a...
up until that stage, you are being taught civilian things, aren't you? By whom? By your parents? By what? who else? Your teachers? Who else? The church? You're doing work, you start working, work. Your sports, your coaches, all those things. All those people are inputting into your life, are they not? What are some of the civilian belief systems? Is it a rigid system? Is it a, fi is it a flexible system? Fairly flexible, isn't it? There's a little bit of a movement in the civilian system. All right. Flexible. Uh, we could put little discipline. There is discipline, but certainly not in the context of the military. Is everything black and white? There's shades of grey. There's shades of grey, so there's shades in between. What about um, yes and no? Is there anything in the middle? Is there such a thing as maybe? In the civilian world, there is, isn't there? Perhaps, yeah, I, did, I might want to do that, but maybe I don't want to do that. So the civilian culture is very flexible. It's a bit like the bars of the cage we talked about. It's got some give, it's got some take. It's actually here, isn't it? Yeah. It sort of swings that way and swings that way or whatever. At this age, I take you and I now subject you to this training. In other words, I subject you to the military. Military belief system. Is it flexible? What's the opposite to flexible? Ah, now you're starting to see the bars of your cage. What about the sort of wishy-washy discipline? High discipline. Shades of grey? Black and white. Maybe? Oh, you know, yes or no? And if it's no, and it should have been yes, what happens? Okay. So, you have a very strong system, a very firm military belief system. And as you can see, it is quite different than this one. At some stage, you're subjected to the war. Now, remember, the reward for doing the war is life. That says what about the training? Okay, if it says that the training is brilliant, what does it then say about this belief system? It's perfectly the same, isn't it? Because this training is that belief system. So that is an absolutely brilliant plus, plus, plus system. Okay, and on you go with your life. There's the military person heading on and on and on. And we have the civilian person whose culture is very much How many of you wives here have been in the military? None. So you are all part of which culture? Okay. So what I'm saying here is that when that flexible civilian culture meets that rigid military culture, what are you going to have at each of these points? Conflict. Conflict. How can I explain it? Let's use our imagination. Let's pretend that we're all young again, okay? We're back in our 20s, okay? We're all single. And this great benefactor says we're all off to Africa. Off we go to Africa. And there we go when we watch the Maasai warriors, you know? And you as the women, you see this Maasai prince. Square shoulders, tapered, waist, buns, perfect, glistening. And the young guys... See the Maasai princess, you know, everything in the right place. And you fall in lust. And you actually marry. And they fall in lust with you and you get married. Tell me, how long do you think that relationship has got to last? Why? Two different... Two different what? What's that word? Two different cultures. What have we got here? 
Interesting, isn't it? So you're starting to get some pictures about what your last 20 or 30 years. So for you, those of you that are still hanging in there, those of you in the civilian culture that are still hanging in there with your militarised cultured partner, pat yourself on the back. You've done a mighty, mighty brilliant job. Because in actual fact, as you can see, what you've really been dealing with is not so much Vietnam. All Vietnam actually did was reward you. The life of serving in there really said that this worked. What you've really been dealing with for so much of this time is not Vietnam and the memory of Vietnam. What you've actually been dealing with is this culture, this indoctrination, the brainwashing, this way that your partner sees the world. And you say, why now though? Now I talk to you about why now when this breaks through. But along this line, there has to be something that will make you think, realise that it isn't working. What's that? How do you know when this system is no longer working? Conflict until it reaches what sort of proportion or what level? Over. More than the anger, because you've had a few of these. It has to be greater than just a flashpoint little anger, doesn't it? It has to be almost equivalent to that. Your system has to recognise that you're in a state of conflict in this culture very similar to that. In other words, this has got to be powerful enough to make you realise what? That that's not working. These little ones here didn't make you realise that the military culture is not working anymore. They were little indicators. And remember in conflict resolution, you have indicators. You need something happening that is powerful. Could be a separation, loss of your family, loss of your partner, loss of all sorts of things. But it has to be powerful enough for it to trigger in you something that says, hey, this is not working anymore. When that is triggered in you, you go through what sorts of emotions? What happens? How do you know when this is powerful enough to alert you that this is no longer working? Hmm? Depression? All of those sorts of anxiety things. Right, exactly right. All the symptoms of anxiety and depression. All the things that occur around post-traumatic stress. So you start to make some choices when you get to that. You can ignore it, as you have done there and there and there or wherever. But this is the one that you can no longer ignore. And you have options. And one of the things you consider would be that option. What do you think that option is? Thank you. Yes, suicide. Why do I put that in there? It's, it is true, isn't it? One of the things you will consider when you are in this crisis at that point is to end it all. The best way to calm it down in my head and to get all of this in control is if I cop myself, it all goes away. And many of our brothers have done that, have they not? But you've got to be clear that suicide is a considered option. It's a part of the process. You've also got this way. Where's that go towards? Yeah, isn't that funny? It just so happens that if you continue it on, it heads towards this sort of process. Right? And then you've got anywhere in between those. And it's going to be your choice. Things like this, all things like this course will do, will say that if you're at this point, then you've got choices. You can go from here, you can go to here, or anywhere in between. It is your choice. You've got to picture this almost as a rubber band. If you look at between here and here, like a big rubber band. You heard the term emotional numbing? And so I'm sure that some of your partners, some of your women, 
have thought that your veteran partner builds a wall around them. That when something happened to family, your veteran seems to switch off like there's no emotion in there. What, why that is, is very simple. When you're in this environment, one of the survival skills is to turn your emotions off. And in one of the letters that I wrote, it's like putting on an emotional suit of armour. Which means what? Your feelings don't count. Your feelings don't count. You don't have any. Because if you don't have any feelings, what can't happen to you? You can't be hurt. And so when you come back into the civilian world with your family, quite often what do you do to your family? Turn off emotions. Why do you do that? Save, you, save yourself. Because you think, you think that if I don't let them into my life, I'm not going to get hurt like I got hurt here. It worked there. It was a survival skill here. Right? It is not a survival skill in this civilian world. So what happens? It's like a big rubber band that you stretch and stretch. Here you learn to switch off the emotions. You learn that it's a survival skill. And you go through your life and you see these little indicators that say it's not working, but you ignore them, you ignore them, you ignore them. You ignore them up to the point of a major crisis which all of a sudden, this major crisis, is it a calm thing or is it highly emotional? Highly emotional. In other words, that rubber band has suddenly stretched, stretched, stretched to its limit and it's gone, bang. And you've suddenly been hit with the same intensity as here. Only the difference is this intensity allowed, taught you to switch off. This intensity is saying switching off doesn't work because I'm feeling all these emotions. Why isn't it working? Switching off worked. I've been switched off all the way through. Now I'm going through this, it doesn't work. And you start to see now what's happening. So why that, that breakdown is so debilitating? Because what is it actually saying to you? Yeah. yeah, you're vulnerable again. That everything that held you together through this environment has failed. And this is why suicide is seen as an option. This is why your self-esteem suffers because you believe, without actually saying it, all the indicators tell you that you failed. And the extreme form of failure, of course, is to do that, isn't it? The extreme form of escape. So in effect, take this rubber band and apply it back here. You have kept yourself up here for 10, 20 or 30 years. When that band breaks, what does it do to this? It starts to throw you back. At the extreme level of throwing you back, what's the ultimate form of flight? Suicide. So if it throws you back too far, you can end up at suicide. What it'll do, it'll throw you back beyond the flow down to here. What you've got to do is recognise when it's heading this way, do something about it. These sorts of courses, this sort of behaviour is to then to do what? You've swung back here, it's to bring you back where? Back to that flow. Now if you go back to that flow, what have you started to become? A civilian. So what you're doing now is there's your partner and now there's you. And you can have your ups and downs together and we won't discuss what they it may be. But you follow that all of a sudden what you're aiming for out of this is to stop this clashing and so you've got more of this. Now you will have your moments. You'd be silly to not to say it. But if you deal with the clash more appropriately, you work together. Those sorts of skills teach you that when you have these clashes, don't ignore them, deal with them appropriately. But let's have a look at some of the answers. Guidelines for survivors of war. First one is to talk about it. You may think you'll never stop hurting, but you will. So talking about it, that doesn't mean you go and tell everybody, but what it means is you talk to your partner. You start to open up yourself. Your children actually want to know. Now that doesn't mean that you talk to them about the gory worries. You talk to them about comradeship. You talk to them about fear. Because war is about fear. You talk to them about pride. You talk to them about those sorts of things. They want to know. Men don't fall for the male myth. 
Macho isn't much when it really counts. Let others see you grieve. So what is the ultimate test of manhood? What would it be? Hmm? A, war. a war, to fight, to fight in a war. If others see you grieve, what's it really matter? You've already been tested. Why do you have to continue to test yourself for the rest of your life? Expect strange physical and emotional experiences. You are passing through terrain that only those who have experienced severe trauma pass through. War is a highly emotional trauma. Anything where you fear you will die is a highly emotional trauma. You must expect to feel strange. You must expect to feel vulnerable. Don't fear it. It is part of what the process is. You are not honouring the dead by entering into a pact of silence or suicide. Purity and grace follow after you deal with the pain honestly and allow the truth to emerge. What would be the greatest gift that you could give your mate who died? You don't have to tell me, but I'll tell you. The greatest gift that you could give your mate that died is to make something of your life, okay? It's not to be an alcoholic, it's not to be a workaholic, it's not to be an arsehole to your family and your kids. It's to actually make something of your life of value. Number five, forgetting and ending grieving are not one of the same. You'll never forget. You can honour them by giving meaning to your life. Trying to deny that this happened is doing nothing to anybody. It's doing nothing for you it's doing nothing for those around you. It's all about you making something, giving some meaning to your life. Think of your body as a bank. Keep the pain in, it gains interest. Expend it, it's gone, good riddance. If you hold it in, it is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Suicidal thoughts are normal. It's part of the process. Choose appropriate people to help, ones who listen and move on, not revisit indefinitely. Now this is hard because this may mean that some of your mates you may have to push aside for a while. If you're going to start this journey, if you are going to start to take this journey, to break through this, to become the civilian and to get on with your life, you are going to have to also be very clear about the people that you associate with. Now, I'm not saying that you don't go to reunions. I'm not saying that you don't go to the RSL. What I'm saying is that when you do go to these things, that you should be spending your time with the guys that have come through this and that are making a fist of their life, not the ones that are going to drag you back here, drag you back here. It's not dishonouring them. It's not being harmful to them or anything. In actual fact, by letting it go and moving on, you would be surprised. They can see you and they can see how you've changed. They can see how you've grown. And you may find that by moving away from them, that guess what may happen? They might actually follow. And the last one is crucial. Later, consider helping others. And I stress this. It is very dangerous to try to help others if you haven't got your own shit sorted out first. So if you are helping others and you haven't got your shit sorted out, I would suggest that you put a hold on helping others. You get yourself sorted out and then you come into it. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching this video. If it has raised for you issues that you feel you need to explore further, please don't hesitate to contact the Vietnam Veterans Counselling Service. There are officers throughout Australia and they will be only too pleased to help.